happen on time, although I know the crowd will probably improve in a few moments. Apologize for my voice a bit, but it's good to see each of you this morning. And we're going to begin, uh, I think, one of the most exciting studies we can do in God's Word. The Book of Romans is a very, very rich study, and it is sometimes misunderstood. But we'll begin this morning with an introduction to the book of Romans, and we'll look forward to, over the next 26 weeks at most, uh, going through Romans in a little bit of depth. I'm not capable of plumbing its depths, but we'll, uh, we'll get as deep as we can. Let's begin in prayer, shall we? Our Father in heaven, as we open your word, help us to open ourselves and our lives to you and to one another. Help us to learn the things you have shown us through the epistle to the Romans. Help us to hear the pen of the Apostle Paul and your Holy Spirit talking to us through this living letter. Be with those that we love, especially be with Dwayne Kastrichy this morning, and be with each one of us. In your son's name we pray, amen thinking a little bit about my father-in-law. Um, Glenda it would probably not be with us this morning. Her mother called her to the hospital. Her dad is, uh, was not coherent. His, her mother was quite concerned, so she asked for Glenda to come up there right away. So uh, I'll be looking forward to hearing whatever I may hear from her in just a moment. Well, the book of Romans. Well, this is one book we... And to introduce this book, we may know a little more about it than many, many others. In the book, the book of Romans, we know where it was written from. Um, there's little doubt that he wrote it in Corinth because he was the guest of Gaius and Erastus was the treasurer of the city who sent salutations. Well, let's take a look at that for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, Paul wrote, I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. So Gaius is definitely a Corinthian of note. And if you're wondering about our friend uh, Erastus, here's our, in the last chapter of the book of Romans, we're going to see a lot of greetings to let us know that Paul knew many people in the city of Rome. Gaius, who has hosted me and all the church, sends you greetings. Erastus, the city's treasurer, sends you greetings, as does our brother Quartus. Well, wherever Gaius and Erastus are, that is where Paul is while he writes this letter. And to be sure that Erastus is in Corinth, all you need to do is look at the street. There is Erastus' name carved into pavement in the city of Corinth. And that says that he paid for this pavement himself. Originally, that was uh, filled in metal, and the metal has been pried out or has come out. There are other, other monuments from the same era that still have that metal in them where the road is still being used and worn. Um, so Erastus was uh, evidently a very, very uh, prominent individual in the city of Corinth, a wealthy individual, and... Uh, Paul makes note of him. Um, he was about to leave Corinth for Jerusalem as he did later, and he went that through Macedonia to get there, which would fit with Corinth because you'd go straight north through from Achaia, the lower part of Greece, up through Macedonia the upper part of Greece and, and up through what uh, of Europe. He writes in chapter 15, verses 23 and 24, but now there are no further opportunities for me in these regions. And since I have longed for many years to visit you, I hope to see you on my way to Spain. And after I've enjoyed your company for a while, 
you can equip me for my journey. Sounds like a missionary to me. Chapter 15, also in verse 25, now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem to serve the saints there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. So this gives us a, a very specific date. It's got to be after 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. For in 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds them to make their contribution in chapter 16 and to give that every first day of the week so there'd be no gatherings whenever he came. Then in 2 Corinthians, he's going to encourage them to make sure that they are fulfilling their promise to give and gives them the, the uh, magnificent Macedonians as an example who first gave themselves to the Lord. So we often quote those statements uh, about, uh, about giving from 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And so Paul heads for Corinth. And here in chapter 20, we read that when the uproar had ended... Paul sent for the disciples, this is Acts chapter 20, and after encouraged them, he said goodbye to them and left for Macedonia after traveling through that area and speaking many words of encouragement. He arrived in Greece where he stayed three months. So after what has taken place here in Acts chapter 20, and of course in, in Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul has been in Ephesus, chapter 19. They had the, the riot in Ephesus. And Paul came and stayed three months in Corinth. This is the period of time we're talking about. So it's definitely the, uh, the spring of 56 or 57 because Paul is intending to travel and get to Jerusalem by Pentecost which is 50 days after Passover, and Passover would be early spring, and you've got to get traveling from Passover to get there to, by Pentecost. We're, we're quite confident that Paul probably sent this letter via, to Rome via a lady named Phoebe from Sincrea, and that should be Eastern with an A. I usually spell Eastern correctly, but my fingers did not do that. Um, and uh, here, Romans chapter 16 and verse 1, Paul will say, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Sincrea. Welcome her in the, in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her with anything she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. Sincrea was the major port on the eastern side of Corinth. There was a hill in between, and they actually had a wooden railroad of sorts to slide goods along this wooden, these wooden rails between the city of Corinth and this seaport of Sincrea. And uh, so that's the major seaport, and for some reason they seemed, and of course, uh, uh, Phoebe is herself from Sincrea. We know Paul will stop in Sincrea in order to uh, shave his head because he had a vow on his way to Rome. And so there he seems to pick up Phoebe and she carries the letter. So, concluding all that, Paul wrote the letter from the city of Corinth during the three months he was there as he was about to travel to Jerusalem for Pentecost, and that puts the book in the spring of A.D. 56 or A.D. 57, because Paul intends to get there uh, by mid-late summer of 56 or 57. Who's he writing to? Well, he says in chapter 1, verse 7, he is writing to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Well, that doesn't mean he's writing to everybody in Rome. He is, uh, he is narrowing down all of the people of Rome 
everyone who is called to be a saint, everyone who is loved by God. So it's the, the obedient, and uh, clearly it's Jew and Gentile. Christians are there in the capital of the empire. Definitely Jews and Gentiles alike meeting in churches, in homes, throughout the city. But since he's writing to everybody, and there is a great number of people here who do not know him, he's never met personally, I think this is the letter we would think in the New Testament that was written to me as much as any other. They're all written to us. They have been saved in posterity. They are our scriptures. But here Paul's writing a letter especially to us. And uh, if I may interject something for just a moment, in verse, uh, here in chapter 1, this is not in the, in the presentation, but it's been in my mind as I was writing, as getting ready to, to share this material. Paul intends to give them some sort of a gift. Chapter 1, beginning verse 11, Paul writes, For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of you and me. He's sending us the greatest doctrinal discourse in the New Testament. The book of Hebrews arguably has a different theme, but is just as deep. But this one certainly applies to us very much. What kind of a gift can he give that would be better than that? Nothing better, but he's got to be talking, as far as I'm concerned, about the laying on of hands of the apostles to pass on the Holy Spirit. That's, that's the kind of gift we're talking about. In Acts the 8th chapter, even Simon the sorcerer was able to see that it was through the laying on of the, hand, of hands, of the apostles' hands that the Holy Spirit was given. Paul was offering, it seems, that gift to new believers he found in Acts chapter 19 when they asked, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And their response was, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so Paul's request is, what then, into what then were you baptized? And those individuals in Acts 19 were baptized into John's baptism. Paul wants to be there to lay hands on them. So want, I, I want you to think about this book as being especially written to you and to me and what it has to say about every Christian and the Holy Spirit is for you and is for me. Uh, my father was a fine gospel preacher and an evangelist, and he, was all, he was working in a mission field in Colorado, working with a lot of new Christians, a lot of weak Christians, and we talked a lot about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and about the errors today that come about because people are talking about the Holy Spirit and expecting and so great, deeply desiring uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit and be able to speak in tongues and perform miracles. And people on the TV are claiming these things are going on. And he was emphasizing how the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit were coming through the, the apostles laying on their hands. And I tended to start misunderstanding my father. For he was always explaining, he believed in the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He, 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 he explained the... The gift of the Holy Spirit was the Holy Spirit in the lives of Christians today, but we said very little about it. We, when we talk, talked about the Holy Spirit in church, we we're mainly talking about the abuses of people in error who were claiming things that just aren't biblical. And so I tended to read every time I read about the Holy Spirit to think about, well, that's talking to the people who had the apostles' hands laid on them. Not this book. It may rarely be, be talking about that, but when we come to Acts chapter 8, and we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit 
as being a very important part of our lives, remember, he hasn't been there. He needs to come there to lay hands on some. He'd like to impart that gift. No mention of Peter is ever made in this book. And if Peter is in Rome, as traditionally some would claim he was, how could Paul be identifying all of the individuals he identifies in Paul? Why would you greet Priscilla and Aquila and not Paul, not Peter? We'd almost be thinking that there's some animosity between Peter and Paul if Peter's in Rome. There seems to be no apostle in Rome. Another thing I have not put in this, we'll, we'll finish what, I'm, what I put down. But another thing I did not put down was something we find in Acts chapter 18. Turn with me there for just a moment. Acts chapter 18. Begin reading in verse 1. Remember Paul and is writing this from Corinth. Let's look back to Paul's first arrival in Corinth. He has come there from Athens where he does not have a great deal of success. Now, any conversion is successful. And there are individuals named uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others. There are some converts in Athens, but what? But Paul's great oration that's recorded in Acts chapter 17, they're in the Supreme Court of Greece. That's what the Areopagite was. Now, they love to hear some new thing all the time, but that Areopagite, that group on Mars Hill, they were the ones who were their Supreme Court justices. They handled all of the most difficult legal questions of the day. And Paul gives them a very well thought out, well reasoned description of the unknown God, and he appeals to their Greek wisdom. He even quotes some of their scholars or some of their poets. In him we live, in him we move and, and have our move, live and move and have our very being. Even as some of your own prophets have said, we are his offspring. He quotes their prophets as saying, we're his offspring. He does a, a magnificent job. There's nothing wrong with a sermon. But there are deep problems with the hearers. For when they hear about the resurrection of the dead, they just scoff. They don't listen to any of the proof about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. They just reject it out of hand or postpone it. They're not listening. And Paul comes to Corinth with a very different attitude. He is going to know Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that's all he wants to talk about. He does not come to them in human wisdom. And the Corinthians are very are not far behind their Athenian friends. So this book is in that written on that occasion, but here we go to uh, chapter 18. Now Paul's come to Corinth. He wants to know Jesus Christ and him crucified. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth and he and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus who had recently come from Italy with his life, wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and he came to them. That is a very significant statement. There is a time because of rioting that goes on in the city of Rome, likely this has been, this has been described by historians, of the day not modern historians, as being over someone named Crestus is the way they spelled it. So it seems to be an uproar among the Jews over the Christ. And so the emperor Claudius expelled every Jew from Rome, every single one of them. Some of these Jews, two of them were named Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla's a fascinating lady. She's almost always named first as perhaps because she is the most outstanding or most outgoing of the personality between this couple. But there is some evidence that she may have been of noble birth in Rome while, Priscilla, while Aquila 
may have been a freedman and actually been a slave beforehand. So quite a mismatch when it came to marriage. And so uh, when it came to uh, social standing, they may have been miles apart and been quite a mixed couple that way. And so Priscilla is often named first. But Priscilla and Aquila are there, and every single Jew has been driven out of Rome. They didn't meet Paul and become a Christian. They were Christians already. He finds these Jewish believers with him, and they've come from Rome. They will go back to Rome, for Paul will greet them here in uh, chapter 16 of Romans. What effect do you think that had on the church, the churches of Rome? That every single Jew was driven out. Does it mean the church stopped growing? Every single Gentile Christian could stay. And so, there is a thought here. I think we, we need to take that event and that will help us understand why Paul's got to write this letter to Rome, why they need it so desperately. He's going to be intimately acquainted with the situation because he has spent all these months working right alongside Priscilla and Aquila. They're his co-workers. They're his advanced team in the city of Ephesus. He leaves them there and they do the groundwork and he'll come back to establish the church in Ephesus later on. But they've gone back to Rome, but they've come from Rome. He knows all about the church in Rome, and now he's going to write a letter all about Jews and Gentiles. Gentile Christians, Jewish Christians. Has God forsaken the Jews? Is there any advantage to the law? How can Gentiles come in? This book is not Galatians. Galatians is an argument with the, the Judaizers who are trying to get everybody to be circumcised to become a Christian. That's not the issue in Rome. In Rome, you have a strong Jewish church, a strong Gentile church. Every Jew had been thrown out of the city. And for some years, if you were a Christian in Rome, you weren't a Jew because they'd all been thrown out of town. And in fact, Priscilla and Aquila are going to uh, leave the Isthmus and, and leave Italy altogether and come over here to Achaia. Well, and so that helps us understand why do we have this letter written about the law, the Jews, the Gentiles, and we start with the sins of the Gentiles, the sins of the Jews. Well, this church needs to get back together. Whenever the Jews return to a strong Gentile church, they need to be accepted, sometimes accept, accepted as the weaker brothers who still won't eat bacon with their breakfast. Maybe offended by some of these things. And the Gentiles, the Jews need to accept the Gentiles as well. And so being one in Christ is a big part of this letter. The purpose, it's often called the Gospel of Paul because he's going to explain his ministry among the Gentiles. It's very practical, emphasizing unity in the body of Christ between Jew and Gentile. It's showing us the unity of the purpose of God, the unity of the gospel from the first covenant to the new covenant. It's all going to be through faith in Christ Jesus. And... We've just read about his very personal desire. He wants to go to Spain, and uh, if there's a missionary traveling through Fort Worth, they're going to want to give us a call and let us know. We're on our way through. If there's any room in your budget, if there's any chance we can speak to your members, we'd like to have the chance to visit with you because the Lord's doing great things and money is needed. So he, this missionary is going to ask to be sent on his way on a mission. This is a... This is a, a letter that is so much more than just a request for funds, but it is that as well. The theme, this is a complicated theme. It is a Bible theme. It is not an original theme. 
It is a quote of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Looking at chapter uh, 1 and verses 17, 16, 17, Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes to the, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That is a quotation of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. Habakkuk is essentially is a lot like the book of Job where the prophet of God having heard the prediction of God being told that the Babylonians, the Chaldeans are going to destroy the city of Jerusalem and going to punish them, going to take the people off into captivity and there will be many, many more people die than survive in this siege of Jerusalem. If you want to see a description of it, read Lamentations. And uh, it's a terrible, terrible thing. And Habakkuk responds. First, the book begins with Habakkuk saying, how long are you going to put up with the sins of Judah? The sins of your people, chapter 1. And in chapter 1, God's reply is, your ears are going to tingle. You've never heard what I'm going to do because I'm going to bring the Chaldeans and they are ferocious. And then God's, then his reply is, God, how can you use someone more wicked than we are to punish us? And part of the response is, the righteous will live by faith. Yep, they're, more, they're worse than you are. And the rest of the book, God is going to also pronounce destruction upon Babylon. And they will also be punished. But God's going to use them in the meantime. Just because you're going to throw a tool away doesn't mean you can't use it first, right? Have you ever gotten one of these inexpensive um, things, to uh, pieces of furniture to put together, and it came with tools? Throw them away. Throw them away when you're done. I save them all. I've got a, a, a bottle full of these weird tools that I'm never going to use again. Just throw them. You don't need, to, need them. Use them and then get rid of them. You don't need them cluttering up your house. Well, God's going to use the Chaldeans. And so the message from Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith, God is saying in the destruction of Jerusalem, yes, people will die. There will be wholesale destruction. They're all going off into captivity. The city will be razed. The temple will be destroyed. But the just will live by his faith. Not everyone's going to die. And I'm going to know who, I, who are mine. And in fact, the, the image is given in one of the prophecies of a, not in Habakkuk, but another prophecy of an angel going through the city and marking people. That one's, that, one's, that one's righteous, that one's righteous, that one's righteous. And marking them so that they are not killed in the final overthrow of the city of Babylon. The Lord knows who are his. The righteous shall live by faith. And Paul takes that principle and says, that's what this book's about. Faith is the response that brings spiritual life to the Christian. The just always have lived by faith and always will live by faith. Whether they're saved in the destruction of Jerusalem or whether it's Abraham it's going to be, or a, a Christian of today, it's going to be that the just shall live by his faith. Let's uh, look at a couple of outlines of the book. Um, a very simple outline. He'll be talking about purpose of his book, of this inspired book. The purpose is the righteous shall live by faith. Well, to start, in order to describe that the righteous shall live, let's talk about unrighteous first. So in chapter 1, we'll talk about the sins of the Gentiles, why the Gentiles were unrighteous. 
but also we'll talk about the sins of the Jews in chapters 2 and 3 of the fact that they need the salvation through Jesus Christ just as badly. And the statement of this justification is given in just 10, 11 verses here, chapter 3, verses 21 through 31, which talks about justification by faith. Then we begin illustrating it. Abraham's our first illustration in chapter 5. And then we read about how Christ and Adam are both for all mankind. Then we'll be talking about holiness, Christian living as far as sanctification, that if the just are going to live by faith, what's that life like? And yes, this does not mean you get to live any old way you want to in chapter 6 through 8. But sanctification does not come, and sanctification is the process of becoming more and more like God. It's always going to be an incomplete process, but we have to have sanctification in our life. We have to be becoming more and more holy and more and more like God because we're going one direction or the other. And we don't want to become more like the devil. And beginning with baptism, he describes how we can't continue in sin that grace may increase. So the big question for the Jews is, how can we be lost? Well, the rejection of the Jews and the failure of the Jews is explained in chapters 9 through 11. Then we move to practical Christian living for all Christians in chapters 12 and 13, whether it is in day-to-day -day living with one another or with the government in chapter 13. Then we'll be dealing with how do I deal with brethren who are mistaken about minor matters? How do I deal with those who, who won't eat meat at all? Or they're very afraid meat's been offered to an idol whenever we don't know it one way or the other. How do I deal with them? Having, having tolerance for one another, even though some may be weaker. And in chapter, Paul's plans are in chapter 15, verses 14 through 33. And then he'll describe his influence in Rome in chapter 16, where he, uh, person after person, family after family, uh, individuals and churches are all mentioned that Paul already knows in the city of Rome, Rome which is something you might expect. If some, somebody was a, an outstanding evangelist in the United States, if they wrote a letter and had never been to Washington, D.C., they probably know a number of people who have moved to Washington, D.C., or they have met while they were elsewhere, when they were in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> so let's begin the letter for just a few minutes this morning. We'll start in chapter 1. Do you have any questions about our introductory material? For me... The thing that opens my eyes to this book, and I'm looking forward to seeing it fresh, is that's for me, the ungifted Christian. Corinth, it seems like so many people are gifted, they're having problems with people speaking in tongues in the middle of the assembly and making a mess of the whole place and not uh, doing things decently in order. And But I find myself, whenever Paul says... How can they say amen at the giving of, how can the ungifted say amen at the giving of your thanks if you do it in an unknown tongue? That's me, brother. I, no, can't perform any miracles. God does not give me direct information like he did in the first century. And yet, is God involved in my life? Yes, he is. Is the spirit involved my, in my life? It had better be or I'm not his. I am involved in that even though I'm not Raising the dead. You don't have to raise the dead for God to be involved in your everyday life. So um, let's look forward to that. I'm really looking forward to that part of this book. But in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, we're going to get started, but it's your turn. Here I've done all this talking. Give me a chance to repeat what you say because we are on YouTube 
and people will want to hear what you have to say, not just what I have to say. So keep, it, keep your comment fairly short so I can repeat it, all right? But let me ask you first, where have you never gone? You really wish you could go. What's on your bucket list, a place to, li to visit before you die? I know you're already in Fort Worth. The Grand Canyon. Oh, that's an outstanding one. Haven't been there yet? Oh, I need to go there for weeks, not just, I've done the Chevy Chase thing. Yep, yep, yep. And seen it for, a, for an hour or two. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, that's great. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Can you recommend it? Yeah, I got one yes. I didn't give very many amens. That's beautiful. Where else would, is on your bucket list to go see? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Beautiful place. Who's been to Yellowstone? We ready to go there? Ready to go back? Amen. I, I love it. I love it. I got to go there as a boy, and then as an adult, I got to spend a week there. It was just amazing. I want to go back and share it with Glinda. Where else do you want to go? Hawaii. Hawaii. Me too. Who's been to Hawaii? Oh, I'm so jealous. Do they really put flowers around your neck when you get there? All right. That sounds good. I'll get hay fever the minute I get there. All right. Sounds wonderful. Any place else? Is there any city in this world you'd like to go see? I'd love to go to Palestine. Not right now. But I'd love to go walk where Jesus walked, wouldn't you? Love to see that. I'd love to go to Athens. So many places I'd love to go. Now, do you save any letters? What kind of letters do you save? Ones that are important to you. What makes a letter important to you? Who's got an important letter you have saved in the past? What's a letter you have saved? Yes. Uh, Su Susie. I have a series of letters that mom and dad wrote back to me. Back and forth. And they were important to me. Love letters back and forth from mom and dad. I've got those two. Uh, I had no idea who they were to because uh, dad kept calling mom Oodalooney. <laughs> Who's Oodalooney? But those are precious. James, did you have some? A letter from your son? Very much. I had letters that I saved. My father's correspondence over his VA benefits after World War II. The VA and my father both made a mistake together. And it took a congressman to straighten that out. And so the letters back and forth to congressmen and the VA, and uh, he got congressmen to go to hearings at the VA, and he had two congressmen go on his behalf and get the VA to admit, yes, we were mistaken when we told him he had those benefits, and we're going to go ahead and provide those benefits on this basis. But that, that, was, that was invaluable in teaching government. There's some things, letters you just, you got to save. You got to hang on to. Yes. Chris, my, my aunt and my uncle uh, traveled extensively all over the world. So your aunt and uncle traveled all over the world. Yes. They were in the greeting card business. And they were in the greeting card business? Yes. And my uncle would take photographs, and these photographs would be the images on the greeting cards. Oh, and your dad, your uncle took the photographs that became images that were put on greeting cards. And my aunt would send me these cards from wherever they were at in the world, and I saved these cards. Oh, you had to save those. His aunt would send him the cards they'd made for the company from all over the world, and he had, he's got, you've got all those saved? Yes. Oh, that's tremendous. She that's tremendous. All that came from their business. The digital images are yours. From the, we don't want to give out your address, James. 
uh, that might be very valuable someday. How neat. That must be, what's one of the places that you remember a photograph coming from? Beautiful places in Canada, Japan. What a neat, I, neat thing. That, that's great to say. One of the things that was destroyed in a fire was a stack of uh, postcards. Because my grandmother, born in the 1890s, 1880s, she would, uh, she had 1890s. She uh, and her friends could send penny postcards back and forth. And that was their means of emailing, you know, or texting. The text messages of today, they wrote postcards to one another. And uh, they were just fascinating, different. The pictures on the fo- postcards were usually more interesting than the teenage messages they sent back and forth. But those were historical and interesting to us. We hated to lose those. The pictures from the botanical gardens from different cities, they all, my aunt was just, we're going to go to the botanical garden in whatever city we're in. G- James's aunt made sure she went to the botanical gardens in whatever city in the world they were in. I'll bet that was fascinating. Well, let's uh, begin reading in in Romans for just a minute, and we'll we'll be done in uh, less than five minutes here. Paul, a servant of of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh. I have a couple of questions for you. Paul had described him in three ways. Name one of those three ways. Here it is. How did Paul describe himself? Give me one of his descriptors. Pardon me? Servant. Servant of Christ Jesus. That's slave of Christ Jesus. Doulos. He's a bond slave of Jesus. What else? He's an apostle, one sent forth by a superior on a mission, usually by the king. And third, he has been set apart. He is set apart by the gospel. So, what is a servant? A do loss of slave. What's an apostle? How many apostles were there? Mm, Twelve apostles. The official number is 12. And Barnabas gets to be called an apostle because he's he's sent out by the church in Antioch with Paul. And Barnabas are at one point called apostles in the book of Acts. But Paul called to be an apostle by Jesus Christ. Jesus chose 12 They replaced Judas with Matthias through the casting of lots. And then Paul was one untimely born. What's it mean to be set apart? Set apart for a for a special purpose. You have anything set apart in your house? These Jews would understand set apart if they're anything like modern Jews. They're living in a Gentile city and they're communing with Gentile Christians. And if you kept kosher, if you keep kosher today, you do not use the same, you never have anyone who's a Gentile eat from those utensils, those plates, or even use that, any food that's been prepared on that stove it no longer is fit for kosher use. And so kitchens put together by contractors in places with many Jewish people who have to, have to deal with Gentiles, they'll have two refrigerators, two stoves, a separate place to keep milk from meat. And uh, they, they keep things set apart. And Paul has been set apart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help me out. How's Paul going to appeal to his Jewish readers here in verses 2 and 3? What appeals do you see to Jewish readers in this ver- these verses? Right. 
the descent of Jesus from David, that's, that is, a, it just, it's true, but he didn't have to say that. He, he could have talked about him being the word as John spoke about any, any number of ways. But here, as Paul's going to appeal to Jewish and Gentile Christians, he begins by not forgetting the Jews, reminding them our Savior is descended from David. God's not forgotten the Jews. And who else told us about the gospel? The prophets. The, these are all going to be Jewish prophets from the Old Testament. So we're going to begin with this idea. Jew and Gentile, all the way through. Let's wrap up our introduction for just a moment. What do you think, what, what's something that you're taking away from our introduction? Is there anything you didn't realize or think about before about the book of Romans that we've just, we've brought out? There's no crickets today. All the crickets have died. It sounds like crickets at the moment. Did you learn anything from what we're talking about? Boy, I did a bad job. I feel horrible. What you've done is tied a lot of things together. Well, that, that's what we're trying to do. I'm not, if I ever say something unique to me and uh, something new, uh, get rid of me. That's not, I'm not here to tell you something new. I'm, I'm preaching the old gospel, the ancient gospel. But we, we, we do want to bring it all together, maybe in ways we've never thought about before. Um, thank you, James. Anybody thought about Romans being written to the ungifted? Had anybody else thought about that? Because that was kind of a new thought for me. That there will be individuals like Priscilla and Aquila. They've spent time with the Apostle Paul. Surely they had the apostle, Apostle's hands laid on them. They... If Paul, if no other apostle had been in with them, they certainly been with Paul and Paul, and he had left them behind as his advanced people in Ephesus. Surely they were gifted. So there's going to be gifted individuals who've come in contact with the apostles. In fact, think about the church probably being started by those people from Rome that were in the audience on the day of Pentecost. Some are it's named that some are from for visitors from Rome. And you wouldn't send those people home after they've been baptized into Christ Jesus and gotten some training there and been with you for a while. You wouldn't send them home without the information they needed. Surely some have been gifted, but they didn't have the ability to pass that on. So the idea that the book is to primarily all Christians, including the ungifted, I think that's going to be a fascinating idea. Well, we'll continue our thoughts about Romans in the sermon this morning where we've, we've already talked about Paul wants to go to Rome and last week was um, Paul, um, his, the God, God's beautiful gospel last week. This week we'll talk about an obvious God in an oblivious world. So hopefully that will be something you'll, you'll be interested in. Uh, we'll continue next week and we'll get through uh, the first half of chapter 1 perhaps this next week.